love being an entrepreneur and has uh, co-founded, led a number of different uh, startups. And so I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about how that process goes. And he is currently leading his own venture. He's leading 1904 Labs, uh, a venture that he uh, co uh, he founded and, and leads, um, doing all sorts of stuff in the space of uh, data science, data analytics, and things like that. Um, so I'm sure he'd be excited to talk about that as well. Um, and to be fielding all of your questions and to be moderating and also to be asking a few of his own questions, I'd like to introduce you to one of your fellow students, Hans, uh, who is going to be leading the discussion from here. So if everybody could remember, uh, when you're asking questions, don't type them in the chat box, but instead use the uh, panel Q&A function. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier on Hans and helps him uh, sort of maintain the flow of questions. Um, and Hans, take it away. Great, and uh, thank you for your thanks to Mr. Walsh for joining us for this, this Q&A session. Um, like Dr. Kulkarni said, uh, feel free to enter any questions that you have students in the question and answer section. Uh, but to get us started off, I guess I'll go with some of these pre-prepped questions that we have here. So uh, yeah, Mr. Walsh, uh, the first question for you, I guess, is what are some of the factors that made you choose Purdue University as your college of choice? Sure, Hans. And by the way, you can call me Sean. We can be uh, we can be informal here. Um, Excellent. So, I my dad was an engineer, civil engineer. My brother's electrical engineer, biomedical engineers. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do exactly, but I I saw them. I saw them being successful. I thought, why not go be an engineer? Um, I lived. I grew up in Dayton, Ohio. So my dad kind of drew a compass where he could drive the car. So I, I'd like to say it was more complicated than that. But he said anything inside this. 300 meter, 300 mile radius, you can consider. And I got to know a little bit about Purdue, uh, applied, got in, and uh, the rest they should say is history. That's swell. And uh, Dayton's a beautiful place as well. I actually spent a summer out there at the Air Force Research Lab. So I saw that. great spot, has a lot of the similar themes to Purdue, uh, space flight, research, it's all there. Yeah, I mean, first flight, Kettering, you know, in terms of Oh, there's a lot of innovation coming out of Dayton. So, but anyway, I, Purdue was close enough to get back when I needed to, but far enough away to be my own person. And I also wanted a large, you know, could be candid. I wasn't sure if I'd like engineering or not. And I didn't want to go to a university. And if I changed my mind, I have to change universities. Purdue has such a diverse range of things, both in the engineering school and beyond the engineering school, that I thought I'll find the right place for me uh, at Purdue University. And I did. I stayed, you know, electrical engineering and graduated. Great. And well, maybe you sort of keying off of that, uh, what was your favorite class at Purdue? You mentioned how there are so many offerings there, but what sort of helped you pick your path through Purdue? Well, I really liked computers. So I, you know, I was more of a analog and digital controls was my interest in Purdue. I didn't go to graduate school, so I didn't really get a a graduate degree in it, but I did as much analog and digital controls as I could because I really liked that area. Outside of um, the engineering school, my favorite class was a class on political economy from Adam Smith to uh, John Maynard Keynes. And what, it always makes me chuckle because it was taught by a guy who I'm sure, I'm sure he's not a professor anymore. I hope he's still alive, but um, he was an avowed socialist, but he ran a, a furniture store in um, West Lafayette. And I he would have us over and I'd say, hey, can I have that chair? You know, I need that. And he, well, yeah, it's a hundred dollars. I said, no, I need to have that for free. And he goes, no, that doesn't work that way. And I said, okay, you're an avowed socialist, but you're running a capitalist business. And um, I just found that to be very interesting. But I, I liked almost all my classes at Purdue. Uh, I liked all my engineering classes. Um, I didn't really like uh, electromagnetic fields. I didn't, I didn't really understand it very well to be candid. So, you know, for those of you that like it, great. I just wasn't for me. And then I didn't like advanced mathematics. When I got to differential equations and the math professor, I, I was like, well, what are we going to use this for? He says, I have no idea. And so that was the engineer in me saying, how are we going to use this? And the math and the really advanced math stuff, we don't know how it's going to be used. And that didn't sit well with me, but I understood why, you know, somebody needs to understand that. I, I guess that's because I'm an engineer at heart. And when you say electromagnetics, you're touching on some of my key research. So there you go. <laughs> I can't say that I totally understand it. Well, you're a lot smarter than me. I just couldn't, I was much more comfortable in the worlds of 
ones and zeros and controls than I was in the, in the world of electromagnetic fields. But that's why we have a lot of different types of engineers, even in electrical engineering. Definitely. And campus has probably changed some since you were an undergrad here, but what were some of your favorite spots to study while you were at Purdue or some of the favorite spots that you just remember walking through on your way to classes? Well, I was in a fraternity. Um, I had fun. I'm not proud of all the things that went on there. But the one thing I knew I needed to do to get out of engineering school was to get out of the house right after dinner and not come back till about 11 o'clock. And so I would walk from campus, walk from our house to campus and go to Potter every night and go find some place that nobody was around and study. Um, as you know, uh, we in engineering have a lot more heavy workload than a lot of other majors. And so I just almost pretty much every night, Monday through Thursday, I would go to Potter and spend I don't know, 6.30 till 10.30 or 11 o'clock and study there. And I loved it because there was nobody to bother you and I got distracted easily. So I needed that. And I really liked that. Um, the other funny story about campus, when I got there, and this, so this will date me, you know, I'm pretty old. Uh, I started in fall of 1980 and um, the campus was full in terms of housing. And so I got, they said, we'll get you housing, but we don't know where, but you'll be somewhere in Cary Quad. So I don't know if anybody on here is a member of Cary Quad, but, or had been in Quad. When I got to campus the first day, they had put us in the basement. There was eight of us, they couldn't find regular rooms. And four of us got put in a room right across the, right across the hallway from the uh, Grand Prix uh, cart room. In fact, they'd taken half of the Cary Quad Grand Prix team's room to make it our room. So you can imagine those guys didn't like that very well. And when on Saturday mornings, when they came in to work on the cart, of course, they made as much noise as possible. Um, but it's a funny, it's a funny story. Uh, I still love Grand Prix. I love that. It is my, it's my favorite. And that first semester, at, you know, you could hear the announcer in our room at 7.30 or 8 o'clock when they were starting to warm up for like a 1 o'clock game. Because literally, our room was right across the street from Ross Ave. So, I, uh, and, and I thought it was so funny. Purdue had Saturday classes. So I would go to English class, English 103. I would go to English class, walking down the hall, you know, the, the street. I don't even think it's there now, but it's not a navigable street, I noticed. Um, and there's people walking back drinking beer already at eight o'clock in the morning. Here I was going to class or coming back from class. I'm like, this is not fair. But, you know, Purdue, they always guaranteed that you would get your class, but you may not like when it was. But, um, and so, you know, having a Saturday morning class at 730, especially during football season, was not optimal. But thinking back on it, it's kind of funny. And it makes you appreciate those semesters when you don't have the 7.30 Saturday. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Because exactly. I'm not a morning person. I really, I really like to stay up late. So, um, so I still stayed up late, but I had to get up early, especially on a Friday night when you're first time away from home. So. Yes, indeed. Well, we've got one of our first questions from the audience here. Actually, Davis wants to know, uh, what fraternity were you in while you were at Purdue? Uh, I was a Sigma Alpha Epsilon. Some people call it a sleep and eat. Um, definitely not uh, on the top tier of uh, academic oriented fraternities, but it certainly was a key dimension of my formation as a young man. Um, and uh, it wasn't too far. It's over on 406 Littleton. So it only took about, especially because it's, the closest part to campus is really engineering. So it wasn't too bad to get to engineering when um, I needed to walk to campus. Although um, in the winter time, it was a little far. Well, awesome. I've had some good pickup games against uh, so, some members of your frat. So <laughs> right. yeah, it, it's a good group there. Well, let's go ahead and jump, I guess, now to talking about your career a little bit. Um, okay. And, one of the questions we got here is, what's one thing that you know now and that you've learned over the course of your career that you wish you had known starting out or that you wish you'd known in college? You know, I think um, the number one thing that I know now that I didn't know then, and I don't think I learned it completely right away, was that innovation is a team sport. You know, you're not, as an individual, going to uh, make the world spin around. Even though we have uh, pictures of Jeff Bezos and now and Elon Musk and all these really super uh, impactful engineers or entrepreneurs, even they uh, have teams of people that work with them to bring their ideas to life. And so 
I wish I'd have learned it sooner that be, being a good teammate and having your ego in check and getting along with other people, even though they're not like you, uh, they could be diverse in any dimension. And the better, more diverse team you have, the more likely you're going to succeed. And that, you know, the, it, you really should be soliciting ideas from every other people. And some people are natural at that. I had to come to that. I had to learn that. Um, and I'm glad I learned it. Uh, we practice that religiously at 1904 Labs. It's the number one thing we screen for when we bring somebody into the company. Are they a good teammate? Is the ego in check? And it, it was something I wish I knew sooner than I, than I learned it. Yeah, there's definitely a strong lesson to take from that about looking at the big picture, right? And looking at team success as, as the greatest success. And yeah, uh, even though it's harder, it seems like it's harder to get things done in a team context sometimes. Uh, it's the only way to get anything meaningful done. Definitely. And do, do you have any examples maybe from your career where, where you had one of those moments, I guess, where you, you saw that supporting your teammates was what really led to the success of the project? Yeah, you know, um, early in my career in Anderson Consulting, um, we, we were trying to build, I got hired to create a kind of a new capability. It, it's now called Accenture. It was called Anderson Consulting when I was there. And um, it was really important to understand the people that were already there. You know, I was coming in from the outside. I'd spent the first 10 years of my career, including co-op with IBM. And so coming into Anderson Consulting, uh, it also was a very large place, but it was a different place. They did things differently. And really taking the time to learn what that corporate DNA was, you know, how decisions got made, how people collaborated, those kind of things. And not just assuming I could bring what I had learned at IBM to be successful to Anderson Consulting. I needed to understand Anderson Consulting before I could be successful. And, you know, sometimes people join an organization and they feel like I'm getting all this money or I got this, I'm the new person or whatever, and I need to make an impact right away. And the reality is taking some time to understand your surroundings and really understand the way the organization works um, can really pay dividends down the road. You don't step in it, so to speak. You don't make any big mistakes while you're trying to understand. And, and the reality is most people in that organization that you join will know, will know that um, you need to learn that organization. They actually respect people that come in and try to learn from the people that are there before they try to have an impact. That's not to say you want to get swallowed up by that company's you know, culture or whatever like that, especially if you were brought in to make a change or create something new. But even if you're going to try to create something new or improve something that exists, you still need to understand the people that are there and how they uh, expect to be dealt with and, and teamed with and innovated with before you try to make your ideas uh, have impact. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's it's all about that balance, sort of understanding what you're bringing to the table, but also what your colleagues are bringing to the table and how to make the most of those resources. Absolutely. That's great. And actually, now that you bring up your co-op with IBM, I, I think that's a, a great transition back to a question about Purdue. Um, how did Purdue set you up for that early success in your career? Um, sounds like the co-op would have been one of those connections, but... Uh, Maybe yeah, absolutely. Um, that. I am so glad Purdue had a co-op program and I am so glad I took advantage of it. Uh, when I, you know, being a classically trained engineer, uh, I didn't really know what that would mean in, in uh, corporations. And so I had four co-op sessions where I spent two of them at, uh, all four of them at IBM in Tucson. That planet doesn't actually exist anymore. But the first two were in manufacturing and the second two were in, in development. Um, and what I learned was I really appreciated both manufacturing and, and design and development, but I didn't really want to be in either. I wanted to be closer to the use of technology. And so when I got out of college, I actually went to work for IBM in sales, technical sales in San Diego. And I would have never, you know, had the information to make that decision, you know, in terms of what I was right for me and how I would want to use my engineering background, had I not done the co-op program. And, you know, I, Purdue just spent, so much time matching companies with people. And it, it, for me, I mean, I know it's not for everybody, but for me, it was critical to understand what engineering really meant in the, in the real world, so to speak, 
and then how I wanted to use my engineering training once I got out of college. That, that's amazing. And so would you, would you encourage students who are sort of at that co-op phase or even looking at internships for the last semesters or coming out of college, would you encourage them to look for as many different roles in companies as they can to sort of figure out what best suits them? I would, absolutely. Um, I was really, I really got a couple good mentors at IBM, one in manufacturing who hired me for a couple work sessions and one uh, who hired me for the other two in development and gave me an opportunity to kind of rotate around. Enough of a, of a tenure so you could actually do something meaningful, but you got a chance to do multiple things. And the more things you can do, as long as you get something that's kind of, you can do full cycle, uh, the better. Because then you get to use your training. And obviously as I got, as I learned more, I could do more. Cause I was, you know, as a first semester fresh or sophomore engineering student, you don't know as much as you do as a, senior but in every one of those you got a chance to just see how you know how it worked in a company and take as much responsibility as they'll give you and uh it was incredibly valuable to me in terms of at least getting me on the first right the first path in my career uh in terms of choosing how i was going to use my engineering training once i got out of college that's great and the, a common thread to a lot of these stories too is just the importance of mentors in in setting you on the right path early in your career. So I was wondering if we could maybe speak a little bit more about how you cultivated those mentorship relationships and maybe how the mentors came into your life and uh, how, how they continued to help you as you, you grew as a professional. Yeah, you know, when I reflected back, when you sent me some questions that, you know, to think about before we got together, um, I, I reflected that I, candidly, I did not avail myself of mentors as much as I should have at college. You know, uh, Dave Meyer was a very influential young professor at the time, and but I didn't really feel like I could go up and develop a relationship with a professor and do that, and I wish I had, because I think I would have had even richer. I'm happy with my education at Purdue, but I really, and that was more of a maturity issue for me in terms of growing into, you know, using mentors, but I would absolutely uh, emphasize how important it is to have somebody who's already traveled in your, you know, the path you want to travel in or pretend to develop that relationship and learn from them. Uh, I have really developed a much greater appreciation for mentors in, you know, as I've developed my professional career. And then sometimes I was given, somebody saw something in me and mentored me even when I wasn't looking for it, which I am eternally grateful for. Um, because you know, that it was important to them. So I'd say to, as, you know, engineers travel in their career, it's not so much, it's not just look for mentorship opportunities, but look for opportunities to mentor. Even when you see somebody who might be missing the mark or whatever, um, can you help them? And I've really committed myself here over the last 20 years to, to the concept of servant leadership, where you're really, you know, there to help other people be successful, not tell them what to do, but help them figure out you know, what they need to do based on what they're trying to do. And um, so it's both seeking out mentors, but also being available to be a mentor as well. Right, and I, I think that availability is really a key part of what makes it feel so organic. I know the, the mentors that I have as, you know, older graduate students and professors, it's definitely just when you launch into conversation with them, honestly, and just make it an ongoing thing, you, you don't realize how much you're absorbing in the process and how much you're learning. Um, well, yeah, and I would say what I was late, I was a little bit late to the party learning how much the mentor gets from the mentoree. You know, it's, you know, you say to yourself, well, I'm busy, I got so much to do, but allocating time to be a mentor is a two way street in terms of reward. It's, you know, you're helping somebody and, and then hopefully the other person that's mentoring you uh, feels the same way because you both parties get something out of those discussions, like you were saying, and you don't even know what they you don't even know all the time what's going to come out of that. You just start on that journey of mentor, being mentored or being a mentor and allow it to unfold naturally. So true. So true. Yeah, I, I think of times when I've gone over how to use a VNA or, you know, how to read a Smith chart with someone. And it's, it's like, do I really understand this? You don't know until you explain it to somebody else, right? So, exactly. Yeah. Well, we've got another question actually coming in from our Q&A panel, and it's, uh, why did you decide to get into consulting after college? 
instead of going into a more traditional engineering role. It sort of sounds like you started out actually in, in technical roles and then you sort of transitioned to the consulting roles. So yeah, I've kind of spent half my career, you know, if you think about it, you have product companies and you have consulting companies. I mean, in the, in the technical realm. And my first role at IBM was more of a product company. We were helping people use our products to solve problems. And I specifically got into the area of computer aided design, computer aided manufacturing or CAD CAM um, when it was a really pretty nascent field um, in the mid eighties. And I just, I liked applying technology uh, as opposed to developing the technology because, you know, at the time the lab guys, IBM's, you know, you could be working on something that wouldn't be a product for five years. And it just didn't satisfy me. It's absolutely necessary. And product life cycles have really shrunk as well. But um, at that time, you could be working on something that was five years, it would become a product and it may not become a product, right? It might be a dead out dead alley. And I just didn't personally want to be there. I wanted to be working with released products, helping customers use those products to solve business problems. So I spent the first five or six years selling and helping companies use our technology in a very special area, CAD CAM. And then I went into the consulting world um, and helped do raw consulting uh, with Anderson Consulting. And then I've kind of back and forth um, gone between product companies and consulting companies. I did make a decision after Cambridge Technology Partners, we got bought by Novell. It was funny because I, Eric Schmidt was at the time running Novell and he had decided to go run this company nobody had heard of, Google. Nobody could understand. Why is he going to go run Google? And I'm listening to him. I'd never heard him speak, but we were in an integration meeting. He was on his way out. I said, man, I'm sure wish that guy would stay. He's super smart. Um, and uh, he didn't. And Novell bought Cambridge. And that was my last uh, foray in a really large company. And I made a decision to say, I don't want to be in large companies anymore. I love large companies and their ability to do things. But personally, I wanted to be in small companies. And that's the at that point around um, 2003 or so is when I said goodbye to large companies in terms of working in them and started working for venture backed and private equity backed companies. And then ultimately started a couple of companies myself here in the last 10 years. Um, so I really have split my time between product companies and consulting companies. And there's no perfect thing. There's benefits to being in a product company and there's benefits to being a consulting company. I like both. I just happen to be in a consulting company right now. We may, there's some things we're thinking about, especially with the cloud and how easy it is um, to build a product these days. We may productize some of our ideas, but the downside is it is so easy to productize your ideas now. Um, there's so many ideas that really aren't gonna scale out there because the barrier to productizing ideas is so low. So that's another kind of pitfall for uh, budding entrepreneurs in terms of productizing ideas. But to summarize, I've spent half my time in product companies, half my time is in consulting companies. I like both. Great, I, th I think that's a, a very thorough answer there. Um, and so sort of, I guess, stemming from that, the, the idea that you've split your time between consulting and, and also product development or product companies and consulting companies, would you say that there's a different philosophy that takes place in these two different types of companies? Like, are, are consulting companies pr approaching their engineering problems differently than the product companies are? And I guess, how have you benefited from those two different mindsets? Yeah, I think... Um... A product company at the end of the day uh, has identified or hopefully has identified a market or set of problems that they're going to solve with their product or software as a service or product as a service or whatever. Um, and they're going to aim and go find people that have that problem. And they might have a consulting organization to kind of consult around their product capability, but it really is. I have a set of capabilities and I'm going to look for problems to solve that, that, that my capabilities solve. Versus a consulting company says, what's your problem? I'll, I'll go figure out how to solve that problem for you, either with a bespoke solution or some combination of available products plus some integration around those products. And so it's a different mindset. Once again, neither is bad. They're both valid business models, but they're different business models. Um, and it just depends on the, the risk on products is there's a big investment to build out the product, although it's less now than it was several years ago because of the cloud and all the incremental technologies that are available, but you still have to make sure you're in a product or problem space that's big enough to support 
you know, if you're going to get your fair share of that, it's going to be big enough for business. Versus a consulting company, if you're really good at what you do, you can grow the company faster, but it is a people intensive business because it doesn't, it scales as people scale. So it's just a different business model. Great. Yeah, I, th I think that that makes a lot of sense there. Um, so we've got another question here about imposter syndrome. And I guess just starting out as an engineer, entering into a new field, uh, and working with some of these large companies as well, where a lot's expected or a lot's demanded of you. How, how did you deal with imposter syndrome or did you even experience it starting out? You know, that's kind of a new term. Um, I think back, so they did, that term wasn't used when I got out of college. It's a relatively new term. Uh, so I don't think I felt like an imposter. Maybe I was too uh, oblivious. You know, as I said, some of my skills, my EQ grew over time. I wasn't, I didn't have a super high EQ when I got out of college. So maybe I wasn't aware or even aware that I should have been worried about that. I just loved solving problems. And, you know, I would take on whatever, whatever my leader told me, hey, we're gonna have you work on this now. I say, great, I'll go work on that. And uh, I really wasn't worried about not being able to do what they want to do. I would say um, to those folks that are worried about that, as I, I think I commented earlier, um, I think people put more pressure on themselves, especially coming out of college, than what the company puts on them. Uh, because you know, when I think about, we don't hire a ton of people off the campus because uh, we're a consulting company, so a certain level of experience um, is needed, but we do hire maybe 10% of our workforce comes off the campus. Um, and I tell them, you know, I don't expect you to know, you know, I know where you're coming from. I know what you know, and I know what you haven't learned yet. So just relax, spend some time getting to know your teammates, get to know the client, contribute as you can, and over time learn and contribute higher. You know, because I think some of the imposter syndrome my supposition, I don't know this to be true, is people putting pressure on themselves that are unreasonable versus what your employer expects from you knowing where you came from, you know, what you know. You know, if you came out of college, you know a lot of things, but there's a lot you don't know. And just be honest with, yeah, I know how to do these things. I still need to learn these things. And, and be candid with your uh, teammates and whoever it is you work for. And I think it'll be fine. Maybe that's gross. Maybe that's oversimplification, but I do see young folks coming out of college thinking they need to know more than they know. And we're pretty aware of what, what's possible to learn in four years and what you can't learn until you get on the job. Yeah. I, I, it isn't the saying something like the more, you know, the more, you know, you don't know it. Yeah, that's true. Something that's very that. good. Yeah. Cause I mean, now that I've been around a block a few times, I still don't, I, I even now know more. I don't know. And I just know I need to find somebody that knows this and knows this and knows this. And I, you know, I'm comfortable saying I know these things. I need to find you to know something else. And we'll, once again, that gets back to this theme and innovation is a team sport. You know, it's like, it's not a, it's not a golf. This is not golf or whatever. This is basketball or football or soccer. You know, you're going to be a member of a team. And that's just the sooner you get comfortable with that, the better. Yeah, and I, I feel like some of my greatest successes, honestly, have come from not knowing how wrong I was starting out. You know, you just sort of, you launch in with one conception of the problem and you learn a lot on the way. So um, I, I think definitely coming in with that sort of open and candid mindset is, is a great way to tackle imposter syndrome, for sure. And so I'm going to try to combine a couple questions that we got here, actually. Uh, so give me one second to look at these and because we've got a few things coming on on a similar thread of coming into industry, I guess, from, from a perspective of research. So if, if you're a student, for example, who just really has like research lab experience, how would you recommend preparing for, for the world of industry and sort of what skills are you looking for in, in people who want to join you in industry? Okay, so I've personally never been, other than my co-op experience, been in the R&D area. I've always been kind of in the applied side of things. Um, but I think the, um, the thing that I look for, first and foremost, is an ego in check. Somebody who, you know, is candid with themselves. I know how to do these things. 
and I don't know how to do these things. And it's okay because I'm bringing what I do know how to do, I know how to do well. Um, second is be curious. I love people that have innate curiosity. And sometimes I'll say to our teams, you know, we need to amp up our curiosity because we're not asking enough questions. And so um, questions are the best thing to learn from. And the fact that your education, however intense it was, it's just the beginning. And you know, presenting yourself as somebody who's a, a lifelong learner, who's curious, whose ego's in check, who knows, knows what they know. Go back to your imposter syndrome. You know, take credit for what you know. You know a lot of things, whatever it is you studied and you did well, but just be, you know, acknowledge, yeah, there's a lot of things I don't know and that's why I'm gonna join a team and I'm gonna do, typically you're getting hired to fill a, you know, to fill a hole that the team has. So fill that hole and embrace your teammates. And, you know, there's nothing better than somebody who comes into a team off the campus who has their ego in check, who's easy to deal with, who's curious, who's humble, who isn't uh, unnaturally humble. I mean, they're, they take credit for what they know, but they also are able to acknowledge what they don't know. You'll do just fine. I, I feel like that almost was a, just a, a question in the same thread of the imposter syndrome question. It's, it's about knowing your skill set, knowing who you are as an engineer. You sort of have to build the identity yourself, and it, it's a continuous learning process. Yeah. Um, so on, on the topic of learning, uh, we had a question here about what your favorite class in ECE was. I, you mentioned that uh, economics course that you took, but uh, leaning a little bit more into the engineering space. Uh, well, I can't remember the actual, it was a 400 class. It was a senior level class in analog and digital controls, and it had a lab with it. And I really liked that because it combined a lot of different things that I liked about uh, control systems and computers. You know, you think about when I got out of school, this will really date me, you know, we were, we were programming, the assembler class was programming in 8088, you know, so I mean, this is really early Intel stuff. And so, but I just really love the fusion of the digital world and the real world, which is what controls is, right? You're using controls and you're controlling a real live system, but you're doing it with, you know, digital things. So it's the fusion of the real world and the digital world. And that just, that was something that I really enjoyed. And maybe it was engineering 440. I can't remember. It's, it was a 400 level class, but it was, you know, bringing together a lot of things you'd learned in your lower level classes and starting to apply them. And I did, for a moment considered, because uh, I did some manufacturing stuff, there's an awful lot of control in manufacturing. I, I was almost interested in staying in engineering uh, manufacturing and doing control work, but I really wanted to go see the customer. So at the end of the day, I went into technical sales. Yeah, I, I feel like I have a similar story of, I, I remember some of the first digital courses that I took and I don't work in digital anymore, but just there, there's a definite elegance to, to being able to look at logic from an almost mathematical standpoint. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. cause I, I really liked math until I got to differential equations, you know, to the really high end stuff, which I, there was really no immediate application to, but controls, you know, digital and analog controls pulls together computers, mathematics, core engineering. For me anyway, it was really something that I really enjoyed all those things coming together and being used in, in developing control systems. And so that, that story you, you shared about Eric Schmidt was, was really fascinating. Uh, this, it, it was, it's interesting to see how, you know, just sort of one corporation can branch out and have so many successful individuals, you know, inhabiting the same space. But I was wondering if you had a defining moment of your career that you wanted to share, maybe something that sent you down this path now, right, of more consulting, more into the IT space or a moment where you sort of identified what your specialty in engineering was going to be? Well, I think I talked a little bit about the pivot at, you know, using a co-op program to pivot from, you know, kind of traditionally classically doing engineering and, and doing technical sales and applying your engineering training, but not your core engineering. So that was one key thing. And then the second one I talked about was moving from large companies to small companies. Um, I really love large companies. You know, our company today, our clients are large companies. And why is that? Because large companies have the problems to, you know, they need to solve and they have the money to solve them. Um, but what 
what happens in large companies uh, is they develop a culture, you know, once they get above, pick a number set, and it's tough to change that company. And so if you're somebody who comes into a company and you don't like the culture, then you're not going to be very happy with the way things get decided, the way people get promoted, the way problems get solved. And so that was, and if you think about Eric Schmidt, I mean, I just chuckle because he left Sun. He was the CTO of Sun and he wanted to be a CEO and Scott McNally was not going anywhere. And so he went to Novell and Novell, you know, this is, you know, 20 years ago or so, uh, was the pioneer for networking software, right? Netware. But they had fallen on hard times and he was brought in to revive them. You know, the wonderkin from Sun. And even though how brilliant he is, and clearly he showed how brilliant he is by going to Google and working with uh, Paige and Brynn and turning it into a juggernaut, um, he could not re-engineer Novell. He could, the culture at Novell had ossified into something that was very unproductive and unnatural. And so ultimately he wanted out and his way to get out was to engineer a merger between Novell and Cambridge Technology Partners, which I was part of. And our CEO took over the combined company. And uh, he went to join uh, this fledgling Google and you know, the rest is history for him. So that kind of pointed to me and, and I experienced that in post-merger culture. And I, having experienced other problems with large company culture, I said, I want to go work in small companies where you can establish the culture yourself. So, I, and so I, the learning for me is know what you're getting into and, and, and be aware if you're going to work for a large company, you're not going to change the way they do things. So make sure, and once again, I'm not being critical of large companies because they're critical to our economy, but then make sure you research how they do things and make sure that's okay. That's, you know, that's in line with the way you want to do things. Otherwise, go work for a small company where that isn't set yet. And if you want to be a small, you know, part of that, you can help set that culture from the ground up. But there's more risk in the small world. And in, in 2003 or so, I just said, I don't mind the risk. You know, I've done okay with the large company stuff. I prefer to be part of something smaller so I can help um, shape the culture and, and be in a place that um, is aligned with the way that I want to make things happen and the way I want to see, see work done. Great. Yeah, and I think, I think a lot of us can sort of understand that from the perspective of like choosing a college, right? You sort of have to make sure that the fit is there, the environment matches where you think you can be the most productive. So. Yeah, it's very much that. It's a very good analogy. Uh, a company has a culture, a company has a way of doing things, especially if they're any bigger than 150, 200 people. And uh, be aware of what you're getting into. Because it's not just it's not just what they're asking you to do, it's the system that's available to you to participate in to do that. Um, and just make sure you're comfortable with what you're getting into. Great. And well, so for Purdue's 150th anniversary, the, the motto or the theme was giant leaps, right? And um, at the same time as we were celebrating these giant leaps, Purdue also wanted to highlight the small steps that it took to get there. So um, applying that same sort of analogy to your career, uh, you've had the success going from big companies, big corporations to running these smaller companies that also have great levels of success. Could you maybe talk about the things that you did in your career that positioned you to help build up these smaller companies to a point where you could call them giant successes? Yeah, I think the, uh, we talked a little bit about it earlier. Um, the first thing is to learn what, how things that are successful really are successful. And, you know, it kind of rolls off my lips now that um, innovation is a team sport, but it, it, I didn't always understand that. And uh, how having, being part of the right kind of team is very important to you. And so learning the hard way when you're part of something that isn't that way, or you as a, and myself, and not a good teammate. You know, maybe I was uh, not an easy person to deal with, you know, and I, so then I wasn't a, a, the kind of teammate that I needed to be. It's all those things that you learn. You had put in some of the comments or some of the things that you sent to me to think about in terms of failure and things like that. The best learning comes from not getting what you want. 
I mean, well, granted, you don't want to be failure all the time. I mean, nobody wants to do that. But when something doesn't go the way you expect it to go or the way you wanted it to go, the best thing you can do is do self-introspection. You know, we use Agile software delivery and one of the, one of the ceremonies of Agile is a retro. And so having the discipline to do a retrospective or retro on things when they don't go well um, will lead to future success. Um, the biggest failure I've had in my career uh, was relatively recently. It was, um, let's see, when did the company go bonkers? We went casters up in 2010. It was a, it was a software company uh, formed by a couple of engineers who had been very successful in their prior company and they were going to reinvent the way software was built. They were going to build software with models versus code. And um, I brought in as the professional CEO in 2006. And we spent the next, and they had already spent, because they had made a ton of money on their prior company. So they were in a, into this company about 18 million when I got there. And we, we proceeded to burn through another 17 million. And, and my own personal amount was about five. I put money in too. I burned, I, I torched about a half a million dollars. And at the end of the day, what we failed to do was understand the mental model of the engineer, the software engineer. They had no interest in building software via models. Even though that sounded really good to the executives, because it would be faster and the software would be cheaper to maintain, blah, blah, blah. The people at the core of building software had no interest. And the reason is, Engineers like to talk about themselves. I'm a React developer, or I'm a Vue developer, or I know REST APIs. They talk about themselves, they brand themselves by the technologies that they know, and we were trying to abstract all that away. And um, it seared in me how important this thing called human-centered design is, where you want to fall in love with the problem. You want to understand the humans you're trying to make their life better. And uh, it was a half a million dollar education. I learned as a lot more expensive than my degree at Purdue. And I learned quite a bit. And if you look at our website at 1904 Labs, you'll see Human Centered Design Agile or HCD Agile is a core methodology of ours because we tell our clients, we want to fall in love with the problem and stay there, not the tech. I mean, you can use whatever tech you want, but you gotta make sure you're in fall in love with the problem. And that's just an example. That was the most expensive lesson of my career. It wasn't the only one. But I try when I have a failure, whether it's a, horrific one like that, that cost me half a million dollars, or one that's cheaper, I say to myself, I didn't get what I wanted. Now, let me be honest with myself. Why was that? And what am I going to do differently so that doesn't happen again? And so there's a whole series of those. And I just would say to people, and this, this gets back to the imposter syndrome and being comfortable with yourself, is failure is a great teacher if you only let it teach you. And be honest with yourself. And it's not a, it's not a, don't take it personally. You, you know, now if you keep making the same mistake again, you probably should take that personally. But when you make a mistake or something doesn't happen, it's an opportunity to learn and it's not personal. And, and the sooner you get comfortable with that, that everybody makes mistakes, some big, some not so big, but it's what they do with those mistakes that really matters in the, in the, in the duration of a 30, 40, 50 year kind of career once you leave college. I, I think sort of there are different ways to fail is, is a good way right. to put that too. Just different. Yeah, didn't Edison, I don't know if it's a true, you know, these things kind of get thing, but Edison's comment about, you know, I didn't fail 2000 times or whatever. I just learned 2000 ways that a light, you can't make a light bulb. You know, it, it's just keeping it in perspective. And, and when failure visits upon you, uh, there's lessons there that you should take and learn. And so I've throughout my career, whether it's, learning more about how to be a better teammate, how to be a better leader, um, how to focus on, you know, understanding the problem, whatever it is, I've tried to use those failures to not make that mistake again and be more effective going forward. And I guess tied into this idea of failure, right? There, there's sort of the difficult decision when you have to say that a path isn't going to work or a solution isn't going to work the way you think it's going to work. How do you cope with making that sort of final decision there of saying, hey, this product isn't what we thought it was, or we're trying to sell this product to a group that doesn't want it? Like, how, how do you go about convincing your team or, you know, just generally coming to that conclusion and changing direction? 
Well, I don't have a um, uh, kind of a recipe for that other than back what I said is when you don't get the result you're looking for, it is go looking for the whys and then have the courage to accept the answers when you get them. To say, you know, um, and, and when you're, once again, innovation's a team sport, so you won't be the only one making the decision, especially in a, in a smaller kind of context where everybody's got skin in the game, whether they took less money, whether they have stock, whether they invested their own money, whatever, um, everybody's gonna need to make that decision together, including if you took outside money. If you just ask the right questions and, and listen to the answer, and you don't want it to be something else, you, if you find yourself explaining it away, oh, well, that's not, you know, there's an explanation. It's having the courage to say, no, no, we have the data, we just need to make the decision. And uh, sometimes I think every venture that doesn't succeed probably goes on a little too long. But the key is to keep it from going too long because you're not doing anybody a favor by keeping something alive that should be killed. Right. It's almost, you, you can't get too infatuated with the solution. You got to, you know, stick to the problem. Yeah, that's what, that's the aha moment I had back in 20, 2008, 2009, when we pivoted three times and we were doing things materially better, but we weren't getting any different outcome. And it's because the core problem was the people we were trying to get engaged with our solution didn't want it because they didn't have any interest in building software that way. And, you know, it just took a while to finally sink in and say, okay, we're not doing this anymore. And I didn't know much about human-centered design at the time. And now I won't go do anything without a human-centered designer on the team. Because they say very unfortunate things. Like, you know, you've seen the demo of technology and the technologists will say, well, they just don't get it. And I well, it's not their job to get it. It's your job to give them something that they get and they want. And if, they, if you have, if you're explaining the way after you show somebody something that they didn't know how to use your software and you're blaming the user, then there's a problem. And the only and the way to solve that is to make sure you have a multidisciplinary team and you have human-centered designers on your team. Right, and I mean, that's a theme that you see with a lot of an intuitive part of your life. If, it, if it's really designed to, to, to match the, the user's yeah, the needs. Designer knew, designer took time to understand what they were designing, what problem they were really solving. It's intuitive how to use whatever it is they give you. And, that, and you immediately, I mean, iPhone's a good, you know, iconic example, but there's lots of examples of technology that's just like, wow, I don't know anything else that works and it's really useful and I'm telling my friends about it. Right. And so after these pivots, I guess, it, you, you sort of had to have had that eureka moment with the company and with product of, okay, we, we found the right direction. So like, when did you know that, that, that you were successful in, in, in finally pivoting the, the product right spot? And I guess generally, how do you define success for, for these product, products and projects that you start? You start at the point where, um, no longer pushing, you're getting old people want you to help them. You know, whether it's a consulting company that's offering something new and different, or whether you have your product that somebody wants. Um, and so you can kind of tell when you've reached that point, when you're, the energy is more about satisfying the demand rather than finding the demand. And you know, there's no uh, one size fits all to that, but it's, it's when you've kind of pivoted around and and you, you know you've met the market fit, you know, your, your solution uh, really does solve a meaningful problem. Now, in modern day, it's not, that's not enough, that's sufficient, or that's necessary, but it's not sufficient. You obviously have to be found, you see your marketing. The other thing that's really challenging is how do you talk about what you do so people can understand it? So there's a human-centered aspect of your marketing efforts to explain what you do so people can even understand it so that they will come find you because there's so much available now. It's getting through, cutting through that, the noise of all the people making similar claims uh, and having you stand out. But back to the core thing is, you know you're there when you're no longer pushing, you're getting pulled 
on you, you know, whether it's a product that you're providing or whether it's a consulting solution or something like that, you can feel it when the market shifts. And I've been in places where that happened and it's great. And I've been in places where it didn't happen. And that's where your question was, when do you kill it? You know, you've, you keep, uh, keep getting more money, raising more money, but you're just not getting that pull. You need to have the courage to call it. Just because you have money left doesn't mean you should keep spending it. Right. And I, I think back to sort of launching some uh, student organizations and clubs, it's sort of that point where you reach critical mass, right? Where you, where you stop asking, what do we need to do to bring in more people or, or do more of this stuff? And you change it to, okay, we're here. Now, how do we, you know, make the club what it was meant to be? Yeah, you can tell you've reached where it's being, you're being pulled because what you're doing matters and is solving a true need versus you're trying to push it. You can definitely tell that. Well, we have a question from one of our audience members here, uh, and Ethan wants to ask if you have any interview tips for someone just getting started in co-op or in their first job. Well, the first thing I would is yourself. You know, and before you get into the interview, take some time to relax. And I think it ties into that uh, putting too many expectations on yourself. You definitely want to be prepared. So you want to know, you know, LinkedIn makes it really easy to go research the person you're going to talk to. And I think it, I think it shows that, I mean, that's kind of starters, but you'd be surprised how sometimes people come in and talk to me and they haven't done any research, not so much on me and it's not the ego, but just taking the time to, to understand who you're about to talk to. And then just as importantly, understand who the company is and what they're about. Those are kind of starters. And then pair that with relax and have fun. And I, I think, you know, if you're meant to get the job, you will, if it's a good fit. Because once again, you want to have a job fit with you. You don't want to get every job. You know, the goal is to find the right job. And, uh, but, but getting over those basic things so that you set the stage for the right kind of conversation with the person you're talking to is really important. And it comes across, if somebody's done their homework, they know about me and they know about the company, they really understand what we do. Um, it really sets the stage for the right kind of conversation where you can figure out if the job that you're talking about is really a good fit for you. And it's okay if you exit that thing and you've decided it's not a good fit. Um, but if it's, but you, if you are a good fit for the company by doing your homework, a good chance that the company's going to be like, Hey, I, I, I actually would like to have you be a member of our team. Hopefully that's helpful. Ethan. I think you hit on the hardest thing in interviews too of as the interviewee, I guess it's sort of make sure you're asking the right questions. To it is sort of a two conversation done right now and that, and once again depending on how the interview goes it will also tell you something about the company and so if it's kind of a stilted you know formulaic interview now there are some of those in the whole process of people but if it's if it's not a genuine dialogue where it's clear you're trying to figure out if you're a good fit for them and they're trying to figure out if you're a good fit uh, for them, you know, bi-directionally, if it's really not a very good environment in the interview, maybe that's also telling you something about the company. And you don't want to come across as I'm trying to choose you or whatever, just have a genuine conversation, but start by knowing who you're talking to and about the company. So they feel like you've done your homework and you've, and you've earned the right to have a meaningful conversation about whether what you want to do and what you know is a good fit for what they're looking for. And it's okay if it isn't. Especially in today's job market, there's so many jobs, especially for all of you at Purdue, you're all trained, you're all really well educated. The right job is out there. So the better to have a good conversation and figure out if the, that particular interview is the beginning of that best job for you. Great. Well, I'm sure there are a couple nuggets in there that Ethan can take on to his interviews. And Ethan, if you're out there, good luck. Um, 
you already touched on this a little bit when we were discussing human centered design and sort of how your how your company came to realize how essential it was. Um, but how important is it to have a proprietary technology when when you're working on human centered design? Um, do you sort of it is, is sort of getting patents or getting, I guess, IP around your technology the important thing? Or is it more important to package things in a way that solve a problem that you see? Well, I, I get it. The whole, patents is a whole nother world. I mean, obviously, the patent and trade office has really clamped down on method patents. You know, you have to patent anything these days, you actually have to have a, a device of some sort because people were patenting all kinds of processes and really gumming up the works. I'm not a big uh, fan in our in consulting of patenting uh, anything. In fact, I like to share, we're big users of open source. And so I feel it's inconsistent with that point of view. If you're a big consumer of open source, you ought to be a big contributor to open source. So our methodology, which is core to our success, Human Center Design Agile, we make available to anybody else. You know, we're very open about it. We're not trying to, while it's something key to our success and our ability to, to solve client problems, we're also willing to give it to other people um, because I, I'm a much big believer in open innovation and open store. So it'd be inconsistent to be any other way. Uh, but that's not to say that there are certain industries where you do, you spend a lot of money years and years and, you know, a patent makes a whole lot of sense because you got to have a runway to get your money back. So it's really industry specific, but in consulting, uh, I don't see the need to patent anything that we're doing. It's more about how we apply it and teams we bring to the problem that differentiate us as a, as a potential provider to a large client. Right, and I feel like that question almost goes back to where you're drawing that distinction between a consult-based company and a product-based company of just you're, you're selling different things almost. And with the consulting structure, you're selling expertise in solving a broad array of problems or helping your client to identify their problems and solve them while on the product side, then yes, of course you need a product of some sort that you're, right. that you're selling. But, um, you know, I, sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So there's another question here about, uh, sort of how did you branch into being an entrepreneur? I guess this is getting back again to the, the idea of starting with these small companies. Um, and just what do you take from the larger companies that you started off with in order to start developing some of these smaller companies that are solving problems for the larger companies? Like, like was that a matter of taking insight from the larger companies and saying, here's a common problem that I can help them solve? Uh, yeah, not a, not a specific problem. Although um, when I first went from large companies to small companies, the small company I was part of, it was a private equity backed company that had about 200 people when I joined. It had 1,000 people when I left. Um, we were doing our offshore, offshore outsourced product development for large companies. So having come from a software company, immediately went to a, a small company that was providing those services on an outsourced basis to large companies. So yes, but um, more so is having an understanding of the difficulty if you're doing all of the startup stuff I've done has been B2B, business to business, as opposed to business to consumer. And so having an understanding about how large companies buy, how they adopt new technology, um, kind of gives you a sense for what you're gonna be up against when you try to come to these companies with these great new ideas. And um, they have to figure out if you're, they're willing to take the risk on you or not to adopt your technology um, versus something more proven. And so that's probably the biggest thing I took from being in a large company to a small company is don't underestimate how hard it is once you get your product ready uh, to get a company to adopt it. Because there's a, that first customer is extremely difficult to get um, for a small startup technology company. It's not impossible to get it, but it's don't underestimate how difficult that first customer is. Second customer is still pretty difficult, but not as hard as the first, but that first one's really challenging. And so knowing what you're up against really helps. Excellent. And we had such a good flow of questions. I totally lost sight of the time. So okay. we're, we're right here wrapping up. But uh, I just wanted to ask one last question of you. Uh, and if 
I, the question is, is there a final piece of advice that you would offer to this body of students before ending this, this Q and A? Yeah, I, um, I think the key thing in my mind, as you start your careers uh, coming out of Purdue is focus on balance, you know, focus on choosing something you're going to have fun doing. You're going to like the people you work with. You're going to like the company you're part of. It's not going to be, you're going to be in multiple companies over your career, but just focus on balance. Um, the uh, handbook for our company is Stephen Covey, Seven Habits. And uh, it just, I would encourage everybody to read that book and just be balanced. Don't, don't go in what, you know, don't seek too much of one thing and uh, you'll be fine. And obviously the people that go to Purdue are really smart. And so they're going to be good um, members of where, wherever they go. And that just focus on balance. Don't do too much work and not enough personal or otherwise. Just seek a balance in your life as you go forward. And I wasn't completely right about that in my head for the first 10 or 15 years. I am now. And I wish I was sooner. So everybody has to learn those lessons themselves. But the sooner you learn balance is key, the better off you're going to be. Great. Thanks so much, Sean. And I, I'm going to hand it off to Millen now to wrap everything up. So uh, thanks, Hans, for being a fantastic moderator today. Uh, that, was a, a, that was really well done. I really enjoyed this, uh, this discussion that you and Sean had. Um, Sean, I want to thank you so much uh, for that discussion. It was, it was really enlightening. It was fascinating. It was great to hear your stories um, and, and to hear your thoughts about uh, you know, what it takes to succeed. I really think that ending with this idea that we need to find balance is a really fantastic way to wrap up uh, this semester of uh, webinars. Uh, and I hope that all of you really take that to heart uh, that we're listening in. I want to thank all of you.